Okay, thank you very much for coming back from the coffee break. And this talk is going to be about ensemble generation methods for decadal predictions. Uh, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of Camille Marigny. She performed all model runs for this study um, and calculated the singular vector based perturbations. Um, oh, what? <laughs> this was fast. Um, okay, so a few words. Why do we have to improve um, existing ensemble generation methods? I know there are a lot of things we have to improve in decadal predictions, so one more, one less does not really matter. Um, okay, so in ensemble predictions, by doing them, we try to um, um, get a, a sample of uh, the evolutions of the climate state, and uh, we are aiming to get not just any sample and not just any evolutions, but we like that this sample to be representative of the uncertainty. And um, so for perfect um, uh, ensemble predictions, um, it is expected uh, in order ensemble spread being a representative of the um, uncertainty in the forecast. So it's expected that the ensemble spread uh, is equal to the error uh, in the ensemble mean. So this can be evaluated by the spread error ratio. So in case this holds, the spread equals the mean error, then this ratio should be one in the perfect case. In the non-perfect case, if the spread is too large or too small, uh, we will get the values which are larger than one and so small. Well, these are the results for the spread error ratio uh, for sea surface temperature from two um, prediction systems, one MECLIP based on MPISM model and one from the MET office. So um, we see that um, uh, in the first year or just after the initialization, um, the spread uh, uh, in the initialized Heinkers seem to be uh, um, too narrow, so under dispersive. And uh, within one year, um, it seems not to grow as fast uh, um, as the error grows. While to the end of uh, the, the prediction, uh, Lithia 9, for instance, uh, the spread uh, gets uh, um, over dispersed. Um, well, one of the reasons why do we get the narrow spread just after initialization is maybe because we don't really represent the full range of uncertainties in initial conditions. Uh, for instance, many decadal prediction studies, they um, use the assumption of perfect um, ocean initial conditions. So they use uh, different sorts of uh, atmospheric perturbations to generate an ensemble. Uh, well, for instance, MECLIP uh, uh, system uses uh, atmospheric and oceanic lag initialization, by, but lagging the ocean state by one or two days does not really uh, make good uh, perturbation to the ocean state. Well, some studies, uh, for instance, um, in, in this uh, uh, column in the middle one, um, uh, the uh, authors, uh, by the way, this is Ho and colleagues uh, from 2003 <coughs> paper, so they used um, um, to represent the model uncertainty rather than initial condition uncertainty um, uh, using the perturbed physics method. And um, sometimes uh, the decadal prediction studies, they use uh, some sort of, uh, they use uh, the sea surface temperature perturbation. Uh, so as we see, uh, I don't really know whether all prediction system uh, uh, used to be uh, um, under dispersive at the beginning of the forecast, but um, I assume those who use atmospheric perturbations, they are. Um, so this has been a problem, I guess, uh, um, assuming um, perfect initial conditions, while our knowledge about the ocean state is quite uncertain. On the other hand, uh, and this is a good news, that ocean, the, the methods of perturbing the ocean state exist. Um, and, uh, for instance, uh, the studies Zana et al. Uh, Zipperman, uh, they showed that uh, perturbing the ocean state um, affects the variability and thereby this can also influence the uh, predictability scales. 
Well, different ensemble generation methods exist, and those, for instance, that aim to represent the fastest growing errors, the subred vectors or singular vectors, and uh, ensemble generation methods that are used in decadal prediction, they build a lot on the knowledge and experience of numerical weather prediction community and uh, a seasonal forecasting community. Um, the other methods uh, which are not necessarily uh, account for representing fastest growing errors, they are investigating, uh, they've been investigated now in SPECS project and the Meekly project. Uh, well, oceanic singular vector based method was uh, uh, picked for this study and uh, uh, the whole setup was inspired by the study of uh, Molteni uh, and colleagues from 1996, although we had to use some modification of the method because we don't really have the linearized version and the adjoint of the model. Uh, so the Lee model was used. Uh, the first step was to reduce the degrees of freedom by um, uh, applying the the various three-dimensional empirical orthogonal function analysis to the temperature and salinity anomalies from the historical run. So um, 28 principal components were picked that explain 68% of variance. Uh, then assuming that the uh, evolution of the dynamics of the state vector is linear and driven by the white noise, um, we can uh, um, estimate the linear propagator B um, based on the covariance matrices of uh, the state vector. This uh, approach was introduced uh, um, yesterday, I guess, by Matt uh, Newman. Um, well, as soon as we have this uh, B um, matrix, so this uh, mapping, um, we, have, uh, we can uh, select uh, further the norm under which we assume the errors will amplify in the system, will lead to the maximum growth and the time of which they should amplify five years in this case. And then we can calculate the singular vectors. Uh, um, they would represent the eigenvectors of this product here. Uh, well, at this stage, we uh, decided to proceed with the four singular vectors in order to have eight ensemble members for our initialized Heinkas. Um, and just before implementing these perturbations uh, to the forecast, uh, um, we use the phase space rotation and scaling uh, in order this uh, oceanic perturbations uh, being representative of the uncertainty in initial conditions, so they uh, uh, should represent the root mean square error of the GECO2 ocean synthesis, which is used as the source of ocean initial conditions. Yeah. Um, before uh, uh, performing initialized Heinkast, uh, the uh, GECO2 anomalies were introduced to the NPISM model by um, nudging. Uh, then the initialized Heinkast were started by, from 1991 to 2006 uh, every year. Uh, so each, uh, for each uh, uh, starting date, we have two sets of Heinkast. Every set has nine ensemble members, eight uh, uh, perturbed and one unperturbed which is uh, similar in two sets of Heinkes. Well, um, the Heinkes, which are based on atmospheric perturbation, they have different states. So this is uh, the atmospheric state, which is shifted by one to eight dates from the unperturbed state. Uh, they use the same ocean uh, initial conditions. And uh, the Heinkes based on oceanic perturbations, uh, they have the same atmospheric state and different um, oceanic states. Well, before uh, starting our Heinkes, we can um, do a, a quick check if uh, um, our um, initial perturbations, they represent um, uh, the uncertainty in initial conditions. So we compare the spread of initial perturbations with respect to the root mean square error of Gecko. And in principle, so these patterns, they should correspond and the amplitude uh, should, be, should correspond. But we see it's not always the fact, for instance, uh, uh, the temperature at 150 meter depths. Um, so the spread is much uh, smaller than the arrow. Uh, some uh, features are represented in the North Atlantic and something in the uh, Equatorial Pacific. Um, it's a little bit better for the salinity at 150 meter depths. For instance, uh, some features are represented in the Pacific Ocean, also a little bit in the Atlantic. And then for the 1,000 meter depths uh, for temperature, um, I think the spread is uh, well represented in comparison with um, uh, 150 meter level. 
And it's quite encouraging that we get a, a relevant spread in, in the North Atlantic because uh, we heard uh, today and yesterday that uh, um, uh, the mechanisms uh, for initialized hindgas they are um, associated with North Atlantic processes. Um, well, um, this might not look optimal, but we go with these patterns because um, we are happy to have them because we use only four singular vectors, and this is already amazing that uh, they represent at least some um, uh, initial condition uncertainty. Uh, then um, we perform the Heinkes, and we want to know, to know if uh, this uh, singular vector perturbations, they um, amplify in our system if they grow because uh, this is a nonlinear um, dynamical model. And in order to uh, um, understand that, we calculate the amplification factor. So it's based um, uh, on the ratio of the norm of uh, uh, evolved perturbation with respect to the initial perturbation. So this would give us the dashed line, the blue one here. Um, but it does not tell us anything about how singular vector-based perturbation evolve. So this is a total error growth in the hindgas. In order to see how, um, what is the contribution of uh, oceanic singular vectors, we uh, have to uh, um, project the evolved perturbation on the singular vector space. So this is this formula here. And then we get this uh, uh, solid blue line. Um, the difference between these blue lines is this associated with um, um, atmospheric weather noise and its effect on the errors in the ocean. Um, the similar uh, error growth was calculated for the atmospheric light initialized Hanke, so they are started um, assuming a perfect ocean initial conditions that the errors start growing within the first year very fast. They are faster than uh, the, uh, the singular vector based perturbations. And so what this uh, graph is supposed to show us is that so much in terms of spread, so this red uh, shaded area shows us uh, that so much in terms of spread we can get from using atmospheric perturbations. And then this blue area shows uh, us um, um, how much on top we can gain from using oceanic perturbations. Uh, we want to evaluate now our spread, uh, and we use for this ensemble spread score. Uh, this is the same spread error ratio. It's just called differently. So this evaluates the reliability of the spread with respect to error. And then we use the beta score. This is uh, um, kind of a summary statistics for the Talagrand diagram. Uh, it shows the reliability of the spread with respect to the observed variability. Uh, the perfect value for the beta score is uh, zero for uh, the ensemble spread score is one. And everything which is below the perfect line uh, suggest underestimated spread. So we see that, in fact, using oceanic perturbations also gives us underestimated spread. Um, this is for the subsurface uh, ocean temperature, uh, averaged over 300 meters, and we use the EN3 data as the verification data set, which is not quite usual for decadal prediction studies, but we used it because our root mean square errors is calculated with respect to this data set. Uh, we also looked uh, into the spread score for uh, the sea surface temperature. So this is consistent with the uh, slide that I showed you at the beginning that the spread is underestimated uh, when using atmospheric perturbation. Um, the spread is better when using singular vectors. So this is suggested by these white areas here. Uh, the spread is um, um, overestimated in uh, tropical uh, Atlantic and underestimated slightly in the uh, equatorial Pacific. The spread is somehow always overestimated over the poles, no matter oceanic perturbations or atmospheric perturbations are used. And then to the lead year five, we see that uh, somehow oceanic uh, perturbation, they kind of overdo a little bit with the spread. They pr produce over dispersive spread. Um, well, uh, this is a very uh, kind of, uh, uh, we uh, uh, found out that using different verification data sets, um, we produce, uh, we get different results for the same variable and the same hindcast and the same lead year. And so the um, spread error ratio shows us the better uh, uh, spread for oceanic singular vector based perturbations. And this is a very democratic result depending on which re relationship have you built to our uh, singular vectors? You can choose one on or another. Uh, but, uh, so I will go with the Reynolds uh, data set uh, 
because it shows the better spread for singular vectors. To justify that, um, we took a third uh, verification data set, which is based on satellite microwave radiometer, this AMSA E data set, and um, it shows us that uh, actually the hard ISST might underrepresent the interannual variability. And this is shown by this ratio here. So it's uh, by a factor of two, sometimes four, in the Southern Ocean, in the subtropical gyres. While Reynolds SST um, seems to be more close to this um, satellite data, while also um, underestimate uh, interannual variability slightly. In terms of skill, there is um, um, not much difference in the lead year one. Well, oceanic singular vector based Heinkes, they uh, slightly do better than. Um, those which use uh, atmospheric perturbations, it's 5% uh, more of errors that get improvement. And um, the, the difference uh, is 7% more for the lead year five, but it's when we look on the global picture, uh, we can of course zoom into the Atlantic and see that uh, uh, it's actually better for Europe and for the um, Atlantic uh, surface air temperature using oceanic perturbations. So this is one more time, just as a summary for the North Atlantic uh, surface air temperature scale. So this is, uh, um, this blue line suggests that the better scale for starting a little bit for the lead year three than four and five. So that's it. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention and I will be happy to answer your questions.